Hi, I'd like to welcome everyone to this GigaOM webinar. My name is Andrew Brust. The webinar and our subject today is Tuning Your Data Warehouse for Steady State Operation. We'll talk about what steady state really means. We'll also talk about the connection between the way the data warehousing was in the past, the way it is in the present, and if we can uh, really kind of negotiate a, a smart uh, liaison between the two rather than an abrupt change uh, to a completely new model. Our sponsor today is Yellowbrick, and they are absolutely squarely in the business of distributed data warehousing, which makes them the perfect guest. Speaking of the perfect guest, I'll first tell you as host, my name is Andrew Brust. I'm the category lead for data and analytics and BI and AI uh, at GigaOM Research. I also write about that for various uh, outlets, including the new Stack and VentureBeat. Our guest today is Mark Cusack. He's the CTO at Yellowbrick. So first of all, Mark, welcome. Um, and second of all, uh, it's one thing to introduce somebody by title, but it's even better if you can give us a sense of some of your background prior to Yellowbrick. And, you know, if what you do as CTO at Yellowbrick is different from what other CTOs do, give us a little, a little bit of a sense of that before we get into the discussion. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, great to be here with you. Yes, so I'm the CTO at Yellowbrick. I've been in uh, the data warehousing industry for around 20 years now in one form or another. And I came to Yellowbrick by way of Teradata where I managed uh, the product line for data warehousing as well as their advanced analytics portfolio. And um, I arrived at, at Teradata from an acquisition they made of a startup that I was one of the, the co-founding developers at called Rainstore, which was in the business of doing data warehouse archiving actually. So, and that, that goes all the way back to the early 2000s. So um, if we really wanna go even further back, I, I was, I've been in government, doing research and in academia as well before that, always in the context really of kind of large scale parallel and distributed computing. Excellent, all right. And that is really good background because uh, you know I can, I can tell you as a young consultant, I remember having one client with a very large budget that had a Teradata data warehouse and it opened a, a whole new world you know, for me and what databases were about. It was a very exclusive club then to have a data warehouse. It, it is much more democratized now. But that's a perfect example that some of the some of the things that went into that very high end experience are still important today. And, and hopefully we can get into uh, some of the finer points of that. Um, and just to give a, a little bit of navigation into how the discussion will be going, we're first just going to, uh, I guess, lay, lay the framework for our discussion by talking about some of the challenges that come from doing data warehousing in this modern era, in the cloud, the, the extreme model that uh, really is a departure from the way things were um, when everything was very expensive and very much on premises, um, but how the, you know, an abrupt change can create challenges. And then we'll go into some of the facets of that in more detail, right? We'll talk about the difference in cost models and the, and the different cost models that are still available. Um, we'll talk about special considerations that companies in regulated industries have. We'll uh, also want to talk about optimization and tuning, something that maybe in the era of the cloud, we almost stopped thinking of, but in the world of data warehousing, we don't want to stop thinking of it um, because performance is always important. And, um, after we kind of bridge the past and the present together, let's also talk about the future. Let's let's talk about where data warehousing is going. Is as you said, Mark, it's a multi-decade discipline, um, and the fact is that it wouldn't have been around so long and continue to be so important if it weren't, you know, front and center for doing analytics and analytics is in this uh, digitalized era of becoming more important every day. 
So that's sort of our, our table of contents. Let's let's now move into uh, chapter one, if you will, and let's uh, talk about some of the, the challenges to doing data warehousing in the cloud. We've laid a few of them out on this slide, right? The fact that data is decentralized, but putting everything in the in a in a cloud data warehouse with a single cloud vendor is kind of the opposite of that. Um, so if we want to take hybrid approaches, how do we do that? And also, everybody loves the cloud when they're just getting started, but then once things are in an ongoing operational mode, maybe, maybe the, the pricing and the cost that goes with that um, can lead to some, I don't know, some unexpected results. So those are all teasers really. Can you take us beyond the teasers and, and help us understand this and, and also hopefully give us some optimism that uh, these aren't just challenges, but there are solutions. Certainly will. I, I mean, it, it's, it's, it must be a struggle for anyone in the architecture business in, in a large bank or other enterprise when they're thinking about how they satisfy what might be a mandate to move their data warehousing operations to the cloud. Um, because it's easy to say, just lift and shift that data warehouse from on-prem and put it in the cloud and everything's going to be fine. But but we know in reality that's not the case. Um, just even leaving cloud out of the equation, think of what you do when you modernize your data warehouse on-premises today or re-platform. It's not just a case of changing the underlying technology. What about all the upstream data feeds, the ETL processes that are going on, the downstream applications, as every data warehouse has all of these different sort of tendrils hanging off it that have to be handled when you migrate to, to a different platform, including moving to the cloud as well. So it, it can be a large scale, multi-year project. And the, the, the areas that I've seen most success in actually are situations where you actually do arrive in a hybrid approach and you choose that new workloads go to the new platform or new workloads go into the cloud, or you choose maybe simpler, lower hanging fruit to start with, where it, whether it's a, a dis disaster recovery scenario where you're replicating data into the cloud for, for DR purposes. So there are different ways I think you can tackle it, but for the largest data warehouses and the, and the largest enterprises with the most siloed data everywhere, it, it, is, a, it is an incredible challenge. Right. I mean, gosh, there are a couple of things I'm wondering about. Maybe I can wonder about them out loud if you'll if you'll indulge. Um, I guess first of all, this idea of hybrid. Hybrid often talks about well, it, hybrid talks about doing some stuff on premises, some stuff in the cloud. You talked about moving new workloads to the cloud, but what if for one workload I actually want to hybridize the way the the infrastructure is handled is there is there a way of doing that that would that would be my first question well well there is but i mean you know even hybrid in its own right has challenges i think as as you're kind of laying out here as well you know what happens is you end up now with two data warehousing platforms potentially one on premises in your own data center and something else in the cloud and Often a lot of enterprises and companies I talk to struggle with the skills gap involved in there. They have a they have, have a devoted staff to manage their on-premises activities in their own data center, and they, they need to kind of reskill and expand their skill sets to even manage what's going on in the cloud. Although many vendors would have you believe that it's all turnkey and as a service, that's not necessarily the case when you're dealing with particular specifics of workloads that are that are um, you know, owned and tied to your enterprise. So hy hybrid is not the end goal in my in my view here. It's, it's a transitionary point. It's a point right now today that is quite difficult to manage because of these differences in technical stacks in different places. Um, and so, you know, what I, what I find is that most companies, ultimately the goal is to move all their operations into the cloud. And it, it really becomes a question of how can you, how quickly can you do that? Although, having said that, there are other industries where, for for security and, and governance reasons, some workloads are still going to re remain on prem for the time being. And so, I think we as vendors need to look for ways of how we can manage that hybrid scenario in, in a much easier way than it's currently uh, managed today. Okay, I do get the feeling from a lot of vendors that 
they really want me to go all one way. Um, I mean, and I can understand why from the vendor's point of view, that makes sense, right? It makes things more straightforward, makes it simpler, probably easier to support, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem real empathetic with the customer. So, you know, I'm wondering about that, I guess. Um, yeah. I'm also wondering about this issue of, of cost. You know, it's almost a cliche now, like, it, you know, the first cliche was go to the cloud, everything will be cheaper because everything's sort of in bulk and virtualized and, and elastic. So I'm only using infrastructure when I need it and so forth. But the, the, the reactive cliche to that is, well, people kind of expect it to be rather low cost and sometimes once they're in full scale operation after the first month or the first quarter, they take a look at their bills and well, uh, they may they may get a number bigger than they expected. With with your customers, with Yellow Bricks customers, what actually has been the the true the true experience out there in the field? What what have you found? Well, talking to to um, enterprises who have moved to the cloud with one vendor or another and and you know they go through typically a poc process you know proof of concept to understand how their workloads are going to behave or at least any any enterprises really should be doing that um, rather than just swiping a credit card and, and hoping for the best and you know what what i find is that everything looks great for the first few months or maybe pre-production but when you get into production i i, I was talking to one uh, data architect who um, essentially had a 7x increase in his monthly spend on a cloud data warehouse. 7x, um, yeah. seven times. Seven times wow. out, out of the blue. And so he was struggling, said to me, Mark, I don't know how I explain this to my CFO. How can we po possibly budget for the year on this kind of basis? Now, and in, in many cases, actually, though, conversations I have, it's not necessarily the magnitude of the spend. It's the unpredictability that's the real problem here. And in a way, it there are good and bad sides to all of this, right? Because what's great about the cloud, you have the agility to try out new use cases, to do exploratory things, to do, do some investigations in a way that you couldn't necessarily do in a fixed footprint in an on-prem data center setting. You know, so you've got an opportunity to invent new use cases that could deliver terrific business value. And so, that, so your, your spend may go up. And so that's fine, provided you're getting the business value on the back end. But to go back to your original point, yeah, I think we're far, we're way beyond the the idea that cloud is cheap. It isn't. Um, it it's going to be more expensive uh, if you don't choose wisely. And one of the problems is, you know, we have so-called infinite elasticity in the cloud, and I think what that's meant is that many vendors have not addressed efficiency problems just like andrew we had to do back in on-prem days where you had to squeeze the most efficiency out of the the small amount of footprint you had in your data center um and i i think we've lost a bit of that efficiency in data warehousing in the cloud today and the idea is just throw more boxes at the problem yeah it it that seems to be a cycle in tech that, that recurs which is there can be a phase of really trying to extract every last bit of value out of existing infrastructure because the infrastructure is at such a premium. I remember really old days when memory was expensive. And so we wanted very, you know, memory efficient software. Then the memory got cheap and then the disk space got cheap and suddenly, you know, the software was uh, kind of, really hoggish in terms of its use of those resources. The argument was that it made less sense to spend money on the engineering for that efficiency mm -hmm. since the resources were so cheap. But then eventually things really get to a almost a de degenerate state. And then everybody realizes that they were kind of cavalier and that uh, resource efficiency is gonna be important forever. Um, and there does tend to be a pendulum swing between the two. Um, so, I, you know, what do you think about that? Uh, especially where it concerns uh, things like, well, I guess the, the types of virtual machines that you might be using, the fact that um, a lot of cloud data warehouse vendors out there really just want you to 
kind of pick from a, a range of sizing your warehouse of small, medium, and large, <laughs> and extra large. It's so different from you know where where it was. Um, I've got more things to ask you about, but let me stop there. Yeah, I, you know, a lot. It, it, it's curious because you know we spent going back to that that what I met what I was talking about a little earlier about squeezing efficiency out of a small fixed footprint. And the cloud vendors, I think, in general, have kind of forgotten all about. I mean, it's evident when you look at some of the features or lack of features uh, that you'd expect in an on-prem data warehouse, like advanced workload management, for example. I mean, there is the, a lot of the current crop of data warehouse vendors out there really don't offer any workload management here. And they expect you to partition your workloads up across different clusters, different data, virtual data warehouses or what have you. So, you know, we, we've gone from having a, an automated way of managing mixed workloads, whether it's, you know, batch loading with um, tactical queries, with decision support queries and mixing those all in one system to going, oh, no, no, that's your problem now. You manage it. Oh, and by the way, you'll need to spin up more dollars for, to handle each one of these things because we're not going to interleave them efficiently you're going to do the partitioning. You're going to spend the money to actually run all of these different things. Oh, and you, if you want more concurrency, more users, add more capacity. Keep adding, keep adding. And so I think I think that's that's one of the, the fundamental problems. The other problem I think is there's very little difference between one vendor in the cloud and another in terms of price performance because they're all using the same virtualized software. They're all they all have the same kind of architecture, a separated compute and storage where you're using, you know, um, virtual compute instances in the cloud and you're you're persisting your data in object storage. So the price and performance, they're all playing on the same playing field here. So what's to distinguish one cloud data warehouse vendor from another, frankly? So what does, I mean, I, I, we try not to get too commercial here, but what distinguishes yellow brick from that, from that? array of everybody doing the same thing what, what's the difference in your philosophy that changes things our, our difference is is that we don't think we should forget about the 40 years worth of heritage of how we did things efficiently on premises and we need to take those ideas and re-employ them in a cloud setting and so it is about why should i have to partition my workloads across different virtual compute clouds or data warehouses whatever they're called why can't an automated mixed workload management system do do that? Um, all of the the kinds of things that that uh, we we've, we've done in our on-prem specialized hardware around optimizing the path that data takes from storage into the CPUs, and it turns out actually that a couple of years ago we couldn't really exploit a lot of those um, performance optimizations at the hardware level in the cloud instance just because the cloud instances didn't have NVMe. SSDs attached to them. That's changed now. And so what we've what we've been able to do again is employ a lot of what we did on-prem in our own specialized hardware and actually transfer that to the cloud. But, um, but that means optimizing not just in the software stack of your database, it means optimizing the operating system kernel level, for example. Yeah, that makes sense. So you, you were talking about SSDs, which for anyone who doesn't know stands for solid state disks. Those are the those are the, you know, these days, the faster drives that are based on flash memory. And, you know, and forget that particular technology. In general, we wanted the storage to be really close and really accessible and high speed. The cloud works on a completely antithetical model to that, where you have storage that is separated. It's sort of off board. Um, it's, it's comparatively cheap especially for storing large volumes of data. But uh, one thing it really isn't is fast. So uh, warehouses have had to kind of negotiate the difference there and say, all right, well, I guess the persisted storage will be in the cloud object store. That's great. But we're going to really need to move things into SSDs uh, at operational, um, in operational settings. And it sounds like you you were describing that and but also saying that that's actually a, a relatively recent innovation so do i have that right uh, yeah so I, I mean if you look at most cloud vendors in operating the cloud they all if they talk about separated computer storage they're pretty much all using the same architectural pattern 
like I mentioned, persist all your data in a cheap and deep object store and just spin up compute instances to run your data warehouse workloads when you need them. But you know, you it's that's a very different picture as you as you mentioned, Andrew, from from where we've been traditionally with you know shared nothing data warehouse architectures where the the drives that the disks are, are cu tightly coupled to the the cpus we're in a very different space now so that introduces new latency and bandwidth challenges the need to introduce caching and so uh, all of us a lot of us vendors have, have have adopted that new architecture for our cloud products but what what I would say that we've done slightly differently is that we put a lot of effort into optimizing the optimizing rather those new data paths that we've introduced into this architecture. And you can't just take off the shelf um, cloud vendor libraries to to do this kinds of things. You've got to really, really go to the lowest level and, and implement your own drivers for a lot of these things to get any performance differentiation. Okay. So that's that's really interesting. And you know, I think what you're kind of saying is a lot of the vendors out there have really wanted us to treat all of this as a black box and not worry about it. And while that does take burden off of us, you know, intellectually or otherwise, it also takes a lot of agency and control away from us. And ultimately that can have serious performance repercussions. Well, well I'd, um, I'd actually say it's as much, it's that the vendors can't look at cloud as a black box. They can't, if they want to differentiate okay. themselves from a price and performance perspective, they need to really understand what's happening at the architectural level. They can't just rely on the standard TCP IP networking protocols to, to exchange data. You know, they, they, like I said, they can't just rely on what you get in stock AWS or Azure um, instances and, and be done with it. As, as, a, as surprise, surprise, every, everyone's cloud vendor product performs the same and costs the same. And, and actually, if you look at the pricing, you see that quite a bit at the moment in the market. All right, we'll come back to that, I think, but we'll let it be food for thought now. Um, let's not obsess on it, but let's, let's at least keep it in the background. Let's, um, let's talk about certain regulated industries. Here, here again, we are at uh, a certain level of cliche, I suppose. Um, we can imagine small startups wanting to be all in on the cloud, doing everything there, but we can also think of certain larger uh, in companies in, in specific industries um, not being allowed to have that kind of freedom, right? If we think about financial services, if we think about healthcare, they have very stringent standards of data privacy that they need to be compliant with. Um, and they also have, uh, well, operational considerations, not wanting to put too many, too many eggs in one basket operationally, um, disaster recovery, high availability, all of those things that they used to manage on their own in very sophisticated ways. When you throw everything in with one cloud provider and maybe one region or one availability zone, and by the way, you do it in a way where you're not even sure what the physical hardware is underneath that very, you know, nicely represented in a in a menu uh, virtual machine type. Uh, gosh, that that changes things. So, can regulated and industries do the cloud? <laughs> um, can they only do it for certain segregated workloads? And if you're a company in that industry. And a mandate has come down from on high that within the next X years, maybe X is five, you need to move everything to the public cloud. I mean, what what do you do with that? It's scary. Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, and a, a lot of regulated industries are moving to the cloud. But to to be frank, the the main stance that I see them taking is this hybrid stance, and 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 that will play out as I mentioned earlier in, in the chat, uh, for, for some time to come. And, and I, I hear stories of, you know, of, of moving to a cloud, even getting it, even getting the, that movement and the decision on whether those workloads and that data can go to the cloud can take, you know, a year plus just going through their own internal compliance departments to get approval for kind of doing that kind of thing for a particular workload. So it's a time consuming exercise and, and, and for good reason. 
you know, there, there could be huge fines levied at financial organizations if they don't maintain their their reporting standards to to the to you know to FINRA and other organization bodies and things like this. And so it's really important to get to get this stuff right. And I kind of see I, I kind of see a lot of these I, I like to like to split the kind of enterprise landscape into kind of three different categories actually. But I, I call this first category that a lot of these regulated industries in are kind of the, the cloud beginners. And that's, I'm not trying to be kind of condescending or, or detrimental, but they are earlier on in their cloud journey. They're being very conservative about what they move to the cloud. Typically, you know, they're regulated industries. They might have a three to five year mandate to move a lot of this in there, but they're, they're taking a long time. Partly they're taking a long time because for some of these largest banks, they might have 15,000 silos of data around their organization and so even just sort of rationalizing what they're going to move and when takes time anyway um, and then this kind of a second category which is really the kind of uh, cloud only organizations and these are less regulated industries but they're kind of maybe even more small medium enterprises that have just gone all in and cloud because they don't have the regulatory shackles to to keep them there and then i think what i've also seen actually are are some larger banks that i put in the cloud early adopter phase they actually did embrace cloud still in a hybrid form but they've been in the cloud long enough that they're starting to see a lot of the limitations of cloud data warehousing as it exists today and they're seeing those writ large compared to what they they've done on prem in the past and and so yeah so i mean it, it's happening it's happening slowly from a regulated industry perspective but um but yeah it is happening yeah so Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad it's happening. Um, and that there's a way to do it. I still, I still wonder though, like we have this one example on the slide here. Suppose, suppose I'm a bank and I have a, a I have a custody business around, um, around securities, for example, do I put my settlement workload and my clearing workload in one place? I mean, we, we talk about settlement and clearing that that's a phrase a standalone phrase by itself. So we tend to think of those two um, as a pair, but do we put those two in the, in the same cloud or do we do we separate them out? Um, either yeah. again by availability zone or region or yeah. do I even say, you know, one of them's gonna run on Amazon Web Services and one's gonna run on Microsoft Azure. Well, example. there is a level of concern amongst the regulators around this idea of, of cloud concentration risk. And, and, you know, you look at it from an operational risk perspective of a financial institution. If, they, if their payment systems or their settlement systems or whatever are all in the same cloud and clouds do get outages, uh, there, you, you can go and look at dashboards that show which regions are out and for how long, you know, and, and see these things happening. So you've got to have a strategy that says, what will I do or what will the business impact do and be if that that region does become unavailable, for example, what am I going to do? Do I go multi-region? Do I go multi-cloud vendor? How do I address that? You know, and then I think there's another level of risk that the regulators are concerned about, and that's the systemic risk to the financial system, because it's not just one bank putting all their eggs in one basket. What if all the banks put all of their eggs in the same basket? Right. Mm -hmm. So there are two levels of kind of risk here that regulators are concerned with. And you mentioned on, on the slide here, lack of transparency. That's another concern. You know, regulators before could go into a data center, could understand and, and discuss with the financial institution or whoever, what their architecture looked like, what their what their approach to um, reporting and compliance was going to be. And that gets harder when you delegate part of that stack off to a third party cloud service provider. You don't get that necessarily that level of trans, uh, transparency. And we, we've kind of been talking about that as well. So, you know, this is this is a yeah, it's certainly a certainly a challenge around the the cloud concentration risk. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I'm still, I'm, I'm still a little bit, I don't know. I'm still feeling a little bit insecure about what, what we really do here, but let's, uh, possibly come back to it, um, and, and move on. Let's sort of talk about this optimized hardware. Again, the data warehouses that I grew up on were all about very specialized hardware that physically lived inside of appliances. You actually 
bought these things that were they were cabinets. Um, and the cool thing was even before the cloud, right? You could buy these, plug them in, and run them. So it did take the burden of having to configure things and install things, uh, you know, node by node. I was relieved of all that. It became much much simpler. But I could rest assured that everything inside of that cabinet was highly, highly engineered, specifically for the task at hand, which was doing um, uh, doing very large kind of dimensional queries where I, I would have lots and lots of rows of data, maybe only a couple of columns that I cared about, but that there, there were specific types of database joins that were involved there. A lot of scanning of data, which in operational databases is something you try and avoid. And, uh, you know, we were talking before about um, having high performance storage and having it really adjacent to the processing versus the cloud model where you have them quite separated. Um, so do I have to let go of all of that and just say, well, the cloud is going to pick for me what my, you know, what my individual physical machines will be. And maybe I don't have as much control anymore. Maybe the, at an individual node level, they won't be so high performance, but I can add more if I, if I need more performance. Like what, where's, where's the reality here? Um, is it, is it, do I have more control than that? And um, do I need to be as concerned as I used to be about getting everything very, very optimized? Yeah, I, I mean, you've got a number of dimensions coming into play here and not just around performance. It, you know, it, it is also a cost idea as well. You, you start to think, you know, if, I, if I'm running my workloads for more than eight hours a day, does it make sense to pay on-demand prices? Does it make sense instead to go, you know, to, to buy hardware or rent hardware in my own data center and have that stuff always running? So you have other considerations as well of, of course, the kind of security and governance and compliance reasons for where you want to place your workloads in the first place. But to, to answer your question, I, I think, you know, the answer is on-premises appliances are not going away anytime soon. And I think for a lot of extreme performance use cases, uh, it's a competitive advantage. And it certainly is for some of our customers in, in, in the finance industry as well, for example. But at the same time, the cloud gives you that agility that you just can't get out of an appliance, right? You don't get that flexibility, the ability to spin up, develop new use cases and spin it away. So I think they, they complement each other. Um, mm -hmm. they, they are there for different reasons and different use cases, but it's, it often comes down to what's the right tool for the right job in pretty much any walk of life. And if you've got extreme query SLAs, high performance requirements, then you're gonna look at specialized hardware, right? If you've got more general purpose, more flexible requirements, then, then you're gonna use something like a virtualized environment in the cloud. So I don't really have the right to buy an appliance and ship it to Amazon or Microsoft or Google and have them set it up and run it for me, or, or, or do I? How do I handle that? Do I have to run it on premises? Can I put it in a a, co a co-location facility and have it run there? How how do I do this mix and well, match? Vendors, vendors like us that we, we actually we actually have our own co-location facilities, so we will run it for you, um, as well as offering the software only in the cloud if you want to consume it natively on the cloud or or as I, I said, that option of running in your own data center. So I think I think vendors can provide and should provide all of those different sort of uh, uh, options here, um, whether you want to run it yourself or, or consume it as a service. Okay, so I can sort of have my cake and eat it too. I can have a very specialized, highly engineered appliance without the physical <clears throat> and operational burden of having to acquire it, put it in my own data center with my own power and my own cooling, right? I can still delegate that and treat it like a cloud use case. But in fact, you you're managing that. Um, yeah, very, for... very, very much. And and I think I think that's a, a common pattern. And again, it kind of comes back to what I was saying earlier about skill sets. Some enterprises are 
it's not core business for them to be running their own data warehousing and have you know a legion of cloud ops people in the background to to kind of handle that they they want all of that delegated to to a third party and so i, I think you know most most vendors recognize that and and at, at the same on the, the same flip side you know there there are typically a lot of on prem data warehouses they want to run it themselves they want full control over that stack it's sitting in their own data center they want to manage it themselves and so we, we see both uh, both things playing out i see all right, and there's there's a note up here about containers. So I guess virtual machines provide one layer of abstraction over the physical infrastructure. Containers really create a layer on top of a layer, don't they? Um, and so how do I move forward into the big, bold, brave container age and still get the control and the performance that I need for data warehousing. Yeah, it, it may it may seem odd. I mean, we certainly have completely embraced um, containerization and Kubernetes in our software stack, uh, running in the cloud, for example. And it may make odd. If you, are you introducing all these additional abstraction layers? But it, it turns out, you know, with within containers, you can drill down to the underlying virtual machine directly without without any real overhead. And in fact. To the credit of all of the cloud vendors, you can actually drill down to the underlying hardware if you're if you're clever about it on even on these okay. virtualized machines. And so we can get access to the actual network interface cards on on these on these kind of you know cloud virtual machines or the the NVMe drives. We can get direct access down to the PCIe lanes at that level. And so you need to be able to do this, like I mentioned earlier, to be able to optimize that path that data takes out of this now decoupled storage uh, you know and a new caching layer that you've had to introduce because of the decoupled long-term storage in these new cloud data warehouse architectures and, and pull it out of that cache and into into the cpu caches as quickly as possible so so what i what i have what i have to say is that it has not been a, a burden or an impediment going through the containerization route as well i think we we've been able to get a lot of the benefits that you get with scalability and resilience of microservices architectures um, and the elasticity and that kind of thing um, with without any of the drawbacks of adding new abstraction okay that's counterintuitive but it makes sense after your explanation mm -hmm. which is that containers are there's multiple layers of abstraction but be, but but there's the ability to kind of expose the underlying physicality of it and yeah. therefore do optimizations. And I guess if I think about it more, the way containers work with storage is containers don't really have native storage, right? They use a provider model. And I guess you can sort of um, insert yourself in that pipeline and create a very optimized storage provider. Am I over-interpreting or is that something that actually happens in your architecture? Yeah, well, I mean, not to go too far down the, the route of Kubernetes and the details of that, but the, the way that you attach, you know, you have your, your Kubernetes container, your pod, and then you attach, you, you attach some storage to that pod, depending on the type of pod it is. If it's a stateful pod, stateful set, as it's called, then you get a, a persistent volume claim that might be backed by an actual spinning, SS, well, spinning hard drive or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a very easy way of actually associating storage with, with these Kubernetes pods, actually, um, and and you, that can all be provisioned on the fly in the cloud, and and we we let things like the Elastic Kubernetes service on AWS handle all of that provisioning for us. And so, you know, what what we've what we have actually done, which I think is rather unique, is we've effectively put an SQL interface onto Kubernetes. So our <laughs> our, our data warehouse doesn't expose any of that, any of those intricacies of storage or things like that to a DBA. They can simply create a data warehouse, expand it, contract it, all through SQL. I think that's that's really important. It's no no one's core business as a DBA is to care about things like containers and microservices and Helm charts and Terraform and things like that. That's that's kind of we hide all of that away. Okay, that's really interesting because at least in the earlier days, if you wanted to start really doing stuff with containers, even if it was just sort of in the background and it. It shouldn't be something you had to have direct awareness of. I don't know. I found that I had to start learning some of the Kubernetes command line um, interface in order to get stuff done. 
But what you're saying is not only have you gotten rid of that, but you've put kind of a SQL uh, head on top of it, which is where most database administrators will be most comfortable. So yeah, I, I, I think this is brand new. I think it's fairly new. I mean, I think if you look at a lot of vendors that have started using containerization in Kubernetes, it's still a command line approach, right? It's you're down at the the, the shell, you you using kubectl, which is the 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 yeah. Uh, I was going to say kube kube cuddle. I didn't yeah. want to get too 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 geeky, but <laughs> you went there, so yeah. yeah. So I, I I don't know. I was finding myself doing you know help you know kube cuddle slash uh, question mark to figure out. What the heck to do? And, and why um, should any why should any data warehouse administrator care about it? All of that. So, right. you know, what we 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 certainly said from a user experience perspective, you've got to hide all of that stuff and and let the software vendor take take sort of ownership of all of that. Yeah, that that's good because I, I I again I think there's a pattern in tech where there when there is a new um, innovation that opens up you know, possibilities that didn't exist before. Everybody gets so excited at the potential of it that the actual implementation and the fit and the finish are kind of uh, sidelined. And so you end up getting to a place where if you're gonna be an early adopter of something, you've got whole new skill sets you've got to adopt instead of people saying, or vendors saying, we're gonna use this innovation in service of the, you know, of, of of the very refined experience we already provide. Sounds like that's where you are. Um, yeah, very, very, are. very much so. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's fine being at the bleeding edge, but you know, I think I think when you come to productize something these days, and, and to be fair, you know, that if you look at the latest crop of data warehouse vendors, that is something that has changed markedly in the last ten years is the user experience around data warehousing. I mean, go back more than ten years, and data warehousing user experience was pretty uniformly awful, whether it's the UIs themselves or just the ease of use or whatever, or you know, mm -hmm. all the, the 500 or 1,000 tunable parameters on any data warehouse. And I think the, the one thing that cloud data warehousing has done for the industry is totally revolutionized the user experience and put emphasis there that wasn't there before, which is uh, to be applauded. Yeah, that and that's... That is a very good point. It does it does open up the club, um, and it makes it it makes it so that uh, I guess some workloads or some applications that wouldn't even be considered before can actually not just be considered but get into a proof of con concept stage very quickly. Um, on the other hand, it is sort of interesting too that you mentioned like well. It, it really makes more sense to make that experience. Um, you know, very smooth. So at the beginning, maybe not so much. Maybe there's an expectation, a built-in expectation that you're going to deal with things that are kind of um, primitive and that you're going to have to pick up skill sets to get really good at something. But of course, if we want the market to become really big and really broad, then we have to make that, um, that experience a lot more manageable. And actually, that's another facet of getting to a steady state, I guess, isn't it? Right. I mean, mm. the market is at a steady state now where the customer needs to um, be catered to and have an experience where it's not just easy to get up and running, but it's it's also a manageable task to uh, have ongoing operations. Um, and so when the industry gets to a steady state, then you know, then then certain things that were looked at as as niceties and luxuries before now now become necessities, I guess. And I think it goes beyond just data warehousing. I think it's the analytics industry in general. I think there are a new set mm -hmm. of expectations that that come with either moving your analytics to the cloud or your data to, to the cloud. I think you also have the self service and democratization of data coming into play here as well. So not only not only has it got to be easy to manage and maintain this data, it's also got to be very, very easy to consume the analytics there as well and put it in the hands of citizen data scientists or, 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 and so on and so forth. Yep. All right. So let's, um, that, that actually is a, a, a well, well, it's a good segue into where we go um, at the end of the conversation, which is to talk about futures. But let's. Um, th this may this may be more review than anything because I feel like we hit a lot of these points already. But when you want to think through all that tuning, that 
all those facets that kind of disappeared into the background because in theory we didn't have to worry about them let's let's bring them to the fore again and make sure that we're we're considering them so these are the different some of the different things that you can tune in the context of data warehousing and i feel like we've definitely already talked about storage um, we've talked to some degree about networking you um, alluded to the uh, ability even in a containerized environment to go down to the network interface card and do highly optimal things there. Um, I don't think we talk so much about the distributed operation. Um, so maybe maybe it makes sense to kind of focus on that here. Um, and also maybe on caching as well. Absolutely. You know, and one of the things I, I think we're going to see um, changing over time is is thoughts about how we make this hybrid operation. So I'm going to take I'm going to take the distributed operation in in the hybrid context, and then also link it back to things like concentration risk, putting all your eggs in one basket. You know, how do you operate realistically a multi-cloud data warehouse or a hybrid cloud um, data warehouses that span span different environments? And um, you know, one of the differences and difficulties has been the disparate tech stacks on an on-prem basis or in a, in one cloud or between two different cloud providers. And, you know, I think one thing that, that we're going to see more of is this idea of distributed cloud coming to the fore where, you know, the, the infrastructure stacks start to not just be contained within a public cloud within any one vendor, the infrastructure stacks are going to move out of the public cloud central setting. And so what I'm saying is that, you know, you can, you'll start to get public cloud infrastructure stacks available on-prem and we're seeing that with some of the vendors today but that that gives you the first set of level setting in a playing field wise the next level is what about the data management and analytics tools that run on top of these stacks how do we get homogeneity amongst them how do we make them look the same and operate in a similar way in different environments because once we do that it makes managing them a lot easier it makes the securing them a lot easier and safer to do you know, and then and then you you sort of start to think of well, what if we have a single control plane that spans data warehousing in different clouds or on prem and in the cloud, and 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 the idea of being able to provision it anywhere. And I think these are the kind of the levels of tuning where folks will want to ultimately want to get to. They want to ultimately sim do a lot of simplification to get there. Um, I I I can't help thinking of buyer's remorse as soon as as soon as i ask you about how granular we can get then i get a little worried that if we're getting that granular then that's going to make things kind of imposing for the customer so but i think i have my own proposed solution here please tell me if it makes sense do we have the ability if we're doing this right to kind of go back and forth to get down as granularly as we need um, without being blocked right on the one hand but being able to abstract away a lot of those complexities at a high level if that works for us is is that spectrum of capability provided is it provided by you and is it provided by cloud data warehousing in general right and i think there are you know there are i think like i mentioned earlier there we are able to access a lot of the low lying underpinning hardware pieces in the cloud even, right? So we, there are, there are mm -hmm. things we can access. But then again, there are things that are beyond any vendor's control. And that is just the fundamental limitations on the networking or the type of storage or things like the, the ratio of drives to CPUs in some of these, these no types, for example, uh, that, that is interestingly don't look like a pattern you would choose if you were curating your own hardware for an on-prem data warehouse, right? Mm -hmm. And so what this kind of comes back, back to this kind of fundamental limitation that a lot of cloud data warehouse vendors are facing. They're all operating on the same VMs. They're all, they're all with operating within the same infrastructure there and the same node types and instance choices. And so there, there, there are things you can do. Some of the things like I mentioned around cutting out a lot of the operations that the kernel does using your own drivers and things like that. But ultimately you're hitting the, the, the wall, the limits of what the cloud provider puts in place, right? Um, I think we get close to those limits with Yellowbrick with what we've done at the operating system level in the cloud. 
but I think a lot of vendors are, are really not even scratching the surface and they're just kind of playing with the, their own database software stack. But ultimately, they're not squeezing as much efficiency out of the system as they could. Okay, so what I hear you saying is don't, don't freak out, Andrew. It, <laughs> it, I, I'm giving you a menu of things that are important to, it, it, to be considered overall, but as your vendor, we'll, we'll take a lot of that on for you. Yeah. It's just the point we're making is we're, we're conscious and conscientious around this, conscious of this and conscientious around this. We're not just going totally off the rack and working at the level of our own our own software platform. We're thinking about both. And so we are we're your 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 advocate at that low level. Um, the burden's not yours, but the but the the precision uh is something that we're thinking of and therefore I'm gonna benefit from. Yeah, and, and the customer benefits at the end of the day because they're paying for the, the infrastructure, right? So they're paying mm -hmm. ultimately for those AWS charges, even if they're going through through a vendor like ourselves. And so right. it, it is absolutely critical that we do the best we can for those customers to make this thing as efficient as possible to use as few nodes in their clusters as possible, you know, and, and, and totally maximize the price performance. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Let's talk about some futures uh, as we kind of finish up our conversation here. So gosh, there's so many things we could talk about in the future, but let, let's try and stay grounded. Um, we've got four things up here. One is around the consumption model. What, basically what are customers gonna want? What about you know, the convergence of data lake and data warehouse and the, uh, the increasing popularity of the term lake house, just to make it even more confusing? Um, and then, well, let's start with those two, and then we can we can talk about the two on the on the bottom of the slide. So, are customers going to start to want capacity based billing versus usage based? It's kind of we're, we're we're ending where we started, but yeah, but I, I I'm think, asking I think you to forecast things. Yeah, go we, ahead. We said the word hybrid a lot here, and I'm going to overuse it in a different context here because I think this hybrid billing, I think it's a blended billing approach that most customers okay. will will settle on depending on their workloads. And often they might start off with workloads and an on-demand basis, then get to understand the, the patterns, the ebbs and flows of, of usage of that workload over a period of time and then fix in on a, on a capacity and switch to a capacity-based kind of reserved type approach there. So I, I, think, I think that's the answer. I think, I think okay. vendors that only offer an on-demand um, billing approach um, that, that that's not a long-term viable approach in my mind. It's not something that we would do. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I, one early innovation was the ability to pause your data warehouse, which again, as a developer and somebody tinkering and trying to do quick proofs of concept, I love that. That made it affordable for me. But if I'm really doing something in production that's running a business, I'm not going to be pausing that most likely. And I don't really want to be paying some usage base rate that you know kind of builds in my ability to do that. I know my workload really well. I know the parameters of it. I know the size of it. I know the you know the orders of magnitude around it. Now that I've learned all that and gained that wisdom, I'd like to use that to size the resources that I need and I would I would like some efficiency of cost that comes out of that. Is that is that is that a fair, I don't know, is that a fair contract or a fair expectation or is, or do I sound too entitled? No, no, I think that is fair. And of course, um, it, it, it still allows you because it's operating the cloud to do capacity planning and expansion in the future. As your mm. workload grows organically over time, you know you're, you're going to have the capacity cloud-wise to expand your data warehouse there in a, in a much easier and faster way than typically you can do if it's an on-prem environment you know, in, in the past. And so, yeah, I, I think, I think, um, I think that that fixed capacity model is, in, is, is, is the right way to go. It's the most eco economical thing to do. A lot of the customers that we talk to, as I mentioned, it's kind of business critical that their warehouse is on 24 seven. It's, it's driving online fraud detection or, or, you know, it's being used around the globe as different teams come online during the day. And so there's uh -huh. a need for it to be running all the time anyway, to your point. All right. 
Now, what about the data lake and and the warehouse? Um, I was actually just watching something earlier where I was watching another database vendor talk about capabilities that they're they're putting in their in their database for being able to talk to data stored in in data lakes and cloud storage. So on the one hand, it seems like things are blending and blurring. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like a warehouse and a lake are completely different. A warehouse is highly modeled. It's uh, based on you know very highly engineered um, tables and relational algebra. And a lake is about a bunch of files and storage, you know, and just because both of them contain data and both of them maybe can serve as uh, SQL as a query interface doesn't make them the same. So like, how do I think about this, especially with some vendors actually merging the words, all right, and talking about a lake house, what, what's the real deal here, Mark? Yeah, and you know, you know, the I mentioned earlier kind of the right tool for the job, and I, and I still maintain that they, they, those are two very different tools, a, a data lake and a data warehouse, and, and they absolutely have their purpose in a business. And as you mentioned, I think from the left, you've got the data uh, lake vendors adding, you know, they've been doing this for a long time now, uh, SQL engines to their portfolio, you know, using open formats like Parquet, starting to claim that they're they're addressing data warehouse and highly related relational uh, workloads. And then of course you've got data warehouse vendors coming from the right that are, that are introducing support for reading data out of parquet formats from object yeah. stores. <laughs> you know, but, so it, it's, it's actually, it's easy. It's, it's more instructive, I think, to think about where the fundamental differences will always remain. And that is, you know, data warehouse vendors, they've spent years developing optimized ways of storing data, the file formats that they use are, are absolutely in, you know, the indexing that might be in place or the, the zone mapping or whatever, it's designed for very, very purposely for the, those kind of high scan rates, um, you know, very, very fast ag aggregations, that kind of operation. And the entire software stack is designed around that kind of file format, the way that data stored in there. Now, the problem the data warehouse, the data lake vendors have as they move into the data warehousing workload is, the design of those formats isn't a core part of those engines. They're, they're deliberately decoupled. You know, Parquet has is, is rapidly become the, the de facto data interchange format, I would say, anyway. And, and, and so, you know, a lot of these ones that are based around Parquet, they, they, they're not going to get the kind of levels of performance that a tuned file format and a tuned stack to support that format is going gonna, is gonna to get. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I hear I hear a lot of people talking about the importance of open formats. And I don't know, there's a, there's almost like an ethical tendency to want to really double down on that. I understand it, but there are also a lot of advantages to, you know, having the, the contours of something really well known and engineering around that and optimizing around it. I, I think it really comes down to the, the difference between the, the ability to do something if you want to, and therefore it being an ad hoc need and the knowledge that you're going to be doing something on a frequent repeated, um, uh, predictable basis. And therefore, because you have intimate understanding of how that works and because you have a critical dependency on it, you want a lot of engineering around it. So it's highly, highly optimized. And I, I think those two extremes are yeah, parallel pretty well what you do with the lake and what you do with the warehouse. I couldn't so, agree more. And it, that actually parallels our business strategy, frankly, because we we go kind of a, an inch wide and a, and a mile deep in data warehousing and just, just focus on that, that very kind of narrow focus of all our investment efforts and engineering on that rather than going let's address a wide range of file formats different type you know data types etc cetera, etc cetera. no we're, we're very strictly in that kind of data warehousing uh, okay and ho hopefully we can get to the point where we don't see it as a as as uh an either or that that both are important um and right. it's not that you have to go all one way or all the other other way the 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 other the other things we wanted to talk about here really are whether we want to kind of have an olap cube model where um aggregations are pre-calculated again because we know we're going to need them and maybe it makes sense to have them pre-calculated so at query time they 
go faster. That was one thing. And, and the other is just, hey, am I ever going to have a data warehouse actually sitting out at a edge field location, um, you know, outside of a data center, outside of a cloud, and, you know, maybe in the realm of Internet of things that that makes sense. So I just I just I just doubled up on you there. But um, <laughs> As we're as we're coming close to the end of the hour here, hopefully we can we can bundle those together. Yeah, well, we'll very very quickly. You know, the the, the materialized view side of things, I, I'm a big believer in. Let, let's stop doing that. We've got high performance capabilities these days where you don't have to generate materials materialized views. You can go against the, the raw data. Um, I've, I've seen um, people getting to a lot of trouble around second copies of data by having to sort of denormalize their their kind of 3nf data that they've got in their data warehouse just so that their um, consumption and display layer can consume it fast enough and there, there are things you can do today i mean we we, we definitely advise this at, at yellow brick for our customers that you don't need to be materializing data you don't need to be materializing maintaining those views you can go direct against the the raw data and that's that's how you should be so hopefully we can consign olap to to the scrap heap of history um on the on the iot side of things this is a really interesting area because data warehouses have never really been associated with with edge and when you start to go back to that idea of distributed cloud and providing a, a infrastructure cloud infrastructure everywhere you then begin, begin to think about, well, what can I place out there? What if I could place some analytics capability out on the edge, close to the manufacturing production line or close to the 5G cell tower? What could I do there that's meaningful? You know, Could I do some local aggregation or local decision-making there without having to backhaul all of the data to some central location? Could I just send historical, could I send aggregated history back to the center for historical analysis? Could I do scoring? of models that have been trained at the center based on that historical data at the edge can i push models out and yeah and and, and the database and the data warehouse i think does have a story to to tell at, at, at that edge and it's still very early days but we're starting to see it amongst our customer base particularly manufacturing and particularly around production quality and at the at the at the line edge there that we're, we're beginning to see interest of can i have a data warehouse in my factory and also, by the way, I want a centralized one in the cloud as well. I need them for availability reasons, and I need them for latency reasons in both places. So we're seeing we're seeing that that use case emerge. Not all that different from having a decent amount of compute and infrastructure in a branch office, right? It right. just you you need you need some autonomy there, and you need some agility there. So centralizing everything may not be the way to go. Oh. All right. Well, I feel like we've covered a ton of ground. And what I, if I can observe the, the one overarching theme to the whole conversation, it's been that, you know, cloud data warehousing gives us a huge range of, of potential and possibility. It's not it's not the closed finite thing that it used to be, especially with appliances, which were physically closed and finite. We have a, a huge range of potential, but we're getting to the point now where we can also have a precise uh, understanding of the engineering involved in a lot of those use cases. We can still have provision, even though we kind of have wide open potential. Um, and those things may seem antithetical and maybe they are, but there is a way to get a, a balance and an equilibrium between the two of them. It, it sounds to me like that's where, when you guys are really pondering everything, in terms of in terms of your product and your technology, uh, if, if I can observe, uh, I I see you kind of I see you striving towards that balance. So that's exciting, and I I feel like the industry in general is not so good at that balance. Mm -hmm. Industry tends to go, you know, very enthusiastically toward the new shiny thing, and um, balance is not often part of that. So mm -hmm. uh, we. Would you would you agree with the with the compliment I've just thrown at you? Or <laughs> I, I think that I think that's fair. But you know what 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 is absolutely true is you know good old fashioned data warehousing is alive and well, and it, it still will be here in in many many years uh, because businesses get the business value they want out of it, and um, and we're all about making that easier to use, more consumable, and keeping it cost effective as well. 
All right, excellent. Well, that brings us to the end of the conversation. And again, a wide ranging conversation it was. Uh, thank you very much, Mark, for being our very gracious guest. Uh, for GigaOM, this is Andrew Brust signing off and hoping that we see you on a future webinar soon.